John Viveki is a cognitive scientist, a good friend of Rebel Wisdom, and the creator of the cult hit series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. A couple of weeks ago, he travelled to the UK for a series of talks, and we took the opportunity to film this dialogue with the philosopher and chess grandmaster Jonathan Rowson. They cover a lot of ground, including John's passion for transformative speech, or dialogos. And so the word dialogos, you'll explain it better than me, but it's the logos coming through the conversation. Exactly, exactly. So the, the patron saint of this is Heraclitus, right, about don't listen to me, my words, but listen to the dialogue, right. listen to the logos, right. right, and all things are one, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's all there. All things are one is a deeply sort of participatory, confer right, right, right? And, and there's about the connectedness, and then he's talking about the speech is actually like it's something and there's a through line going through the speech and that's the logos. Right. Something is gathering in the words right. all all of this stuff we've been talking about, all this ability, all this intelligibility, sure. and it's taking on a life of its own. And little questions like the existence of God. It sort of is a bit simplistic to say, so why doesn't he believe in God? But that is the question I want to ask. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this question. I'm really happy to talk about this question. But that's, that, I just, that's my intuitive radio host question. You know, like, <laughs> why doesn't this guy believe in God? He sounds like he does. Um, so part of it is um, I'm a post-nominalist, neoplatonic, right, non-theist. Congratulations. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> um, so what I mean by that, I'm... I, 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 Sorry, I, I, I threw in that little bit of maybe useless caveat because, mm -hmm. because I don't want to say the thing you say at the party, which is, well, it depends on what you mean by God. So we had our own brilliant event with John, which we recorded, and you can see by signing up to our Substack newsletter. Check out the details in the show notes below. And hope you enjoy this conversation. John, such a pleasure to have time to talk to you today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jonathan. And um, there's so much to talk about. And... Uh... This could go in many different ways. I know you're you're kind of world renowned now for dialogue, which is something that's called dialogos, and we'll come to the distinction yeah. for that in a minute. Um, but many places where you get into all sorts of different terrain and show your enormous erudition uh, and can comment on a great variety of subjects. But what I haven't seen so much is a kind of distillation of who is John Verveke and what are his main ideas. Um, you hear the Verveke name a lot, commenting on such and such a term. You see a lot of Verveke nomenclature. You're even famous, I think, in an affectionately infamous, infamous way for your polysyllabic kind of <laughs> marshalling of polysyllables like a kind of army. Um, but nonetheless, with a lot of insight and, and um, uh, sort of de determination to really clarify things for people and you're a world-renowned teacher and so forth. But what I wanted to do today was just maybe move through a little bit from biography to sort of intellectual formation sure. to tools of the trade to kind of worldview and then maybe get on to little trifles like the existence of God and things like that at the end. <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping for. Okay, so start with, if you don't mind starting a little bit with, we see John Verveke as an intelligent man on the screen, mostly, mostly a headshot. That's how most people know you. Sure. But give me a little story of the embodied four-dimensional historical John, how did you come to be? I mean, without giving the, every minute of every you know every year, just a sense of how you got to this position. It, yeah, that's that's a interesting question. Um, and um, so, I guess the 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 thing where the journey that led me here um, starts with I was brought up in a very um, very fundamentalist Christian religious household, um, and um, only later, uh, after I left, um, upon reflection, did, um, did I realize how sort of traumatizing that was. And then with therapy and further reflection, I've come t to have a more, I don't know if balanced is quite there, but more at least in a more of an ambivalent attitude towards that because I've come, I've come to realize that the taste for the transcendent was put into my mouth, yeah. right, uh, with this religious upbringing. So although I rejected a lot of both the content and the manner of it, um, that taste for the transcendence, I sometimes, the way people use the word mother tongue, uh, this is like my mother religion, uh, right. and it, so it gave me that. Um, and so when when I left that version of Christianity, and I tried some more liberal versions, but when I sort of left that, uh, initially I, I left it the way 
uh, like the attitude, almost like a jilted lover. Right. 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 It was that kind some of resent, almost resentment. Yeah, resentment, and, and, and this, this this could have been better, and that sort. And it was an, an anger, um, and obviously also some grief. Um, and and uh, it, we, we, when we talk, talk about God, we can come back around to that. But um, and so I I was very much suffering, uh, like a, a personal existential meaning crisis, uh, uh, very much. Um, and so I, hap- I, I happened to have, uh, you know, been reading some books that had some philosophical content, and then I got into university and I met the figure of Socrates, and this was, this was one of the transformative uh, moments of my life, because when I encountered that figure, I got a sense of what I, it's almost like when you get into the good relationship after you've been in the one that fails, and you go, oh, ah, yeah, this, this is what I, right? And so I was very much taken by that. Um, but then, and you know this probably as well, academic philosophy, at least when I was doing it right, in the 80s, the, the idea of wisdom and all of that just falls off the table and you get into all of this deep um, analytic stuff about science and epistemology and all, which I found independently valuable, the skills. It's like going to a dojo and you're learning all this power. But that hunger, that hunger for... Uh, for transcendence, for profound connection, for transformative relationship, it wasn't it wasn't being met in academic philosophy. So this is all good, and, it, and knowing about the fundamentalist upbringing is helpful. Um, it's still in the world of ideas, though. I'm, I'm just looking for a little bit of, you know, were there streams, were there hills, um, were, oh. were there, you know, were there, what, what were the other people around you like? What, what, was the school experience a positive one? Something about the regular Mm, who? How did the person become? Because at some point you started reading a lot of books, yes. um, and became a great scholar and great intellect. But something drove that. Was it just the the fundamentalist family context, or was there more going on? Oh, that's a good question. I think. I, I mean, if if you were to ask me to uh, do sort of a retrospective, I was I was dealing with. Um, the fundamentalism came through my mother, and I was dealing with a very um, encompassing, you know, dominating mother figure, and a very uh, and a father who was relatively absent. And so, abandoning the fundamentalism was also, I think, wrapped up with me trying to get some psychological independence from my mother, while also trying to not take sort of the background. Pass the role of my father. Right, right. It was something more like that. It was. It was like how, how can I? I, I, I find I, your strength somehow. It was well. It's. I, I'm just hesitating because uh, you know both my parents are dead, and I don't like speaking of people critically when they can't respond. But um, I, 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 I wanted to know how to be a man, mm-hmm. and, and whatever that means. But my father w- did not provide that model. And th- this is also, I think, why Socrates appealed to me. And, and, and then that was bound up with how do I pull away uh, from the way uh, my mother was very much trying to define me. My mother, um, I d- I've only found this out later, um, my mother and father were married to other people when I was conceived. And so my mother always felt of me as if I was some kind of mistake. Uh, and that, uh, so she was trying to um, make up for her sin by bringing me up in this very puritanical kind of Christianity. And so trying to get free of all of that, if, if you're asking me for what's more sort of the, the psychological guts, that's also why I was drawn to Socrates, I think, because he, he took up, he, he said, there's, there's kind of a parental role here, there's a way of approaching the transcendent that doesn't require this kind of suffocating all right, the way my mother suffocated me, and it gives you a model for what it is to be a man. That's not just some hackneyed, you know, yeah. chest beating thing. So sure. that is a part of that's the attraction. Yeah, well, I'm grateful. It's generous sharing there. Thank you. And, um, and when well, you mentioned the chest beating, I couldn't help thinking a little bit about Tai Chi as well. This is something people may not know about you. Yeah. I know you don't beat your chest much in Tai Chi, I believe, but but still, it's a big part of your life, and it has been for some time now. Right? Well, what happened exactly is um, when I grew disappointed in the lack of wisdom cultivation, there was, a, there was a dojo just down the street that was teaching Tai Chi and Vipassana and Metta. And I went there because I, I wanted to, I wanted to right. 
try and satisfy that hunger. And, and that's, by the way, I didn't call it that back then, but that's where I, I got the idea of an ecology of practices from, because they taught... They More taught, than one thing. Yeah, they taught a meditation, a contemplation, and a moving practice, right? And drawn from Buddhist tradition and Taoist tradition. And so right from the beginning, that was wow. there for me. That's fascinating. And so you were... Um, you know, as all as all of us, in some sense, recovering from childhood and early adulthood, finding your way, uh, finding uh, sort of um, people to admire, yes. sometimes in books, um, yeah. Socrates is mentioned. Now, in a sense, Socrates can be thought of, in a way, uh, at least through Plato's version of Socrates, as one of the early cognitive scientists, right? Yes, so you've yes. spoken about this yes. elsewhere. Yes. But tell me a little bit about that gateway from, you know, your, your discovery of cognitive science as a discipline. I ask this partly because I, I, I did a, a master's degree some time ago where I, where I had to read Howard Gardner's book, A Mind's New Science. Yes, Science. yes. Yeah. And um, I say I had to, like it was you know, a problem, but I loved it. And, yeah. I, and it, I think what people don't grasp about cognitive science is that often they assume it's just, it's just kind of about the stuff inside your head. No. But you realize it's got this anthropology, linguistics, yeah, philosophy, yeah, it's yeah, got the whole gamut yeah. of things. And tell us more about how that evolved for you and you became a cognitive scientist. Excellent. So all of these things are happening about the same time, right? So I finish my BA in philosophy, I do my MA in philosophy, and I come to a point of just, I'm just disappointed, and I, and I, and I, and I leave. And, and, and I, I'd already been doing some training in young, I, and I went into therapy, because I was stuck. In the classic Jungian sense, I was stuck. It was like, like, this was supposed to be the place where I go to do this, and it's just not working. And so I was disillusioned, and I left, and uh, I did some professional tutoring for a while just to feed myself, things like that. Um, and then I I I hear about this discipline. Uh, I I don't I I can't Jonathan I can't remember the actual episode. Yeah. It's it's become so sort of just sewn into the permanent background of my of my biography, yeah. cognitive science. But at some point I heard of this. And I said, but that's what Plato's doing in the Republic. Right. He's doing psychology and epistemology, and like he's doing all of it. And I said, oh, that's what. so. I went back and did another undergraduate degree. I did a specialist degree in cognitive science. Now, because I'd already done philosophy, right. I didn't have to do any philosophy courses, so I was able to do also more than needed to get a psychology degree. Right. So I did both of that at the same time. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> and so, so, so that erudition lives on in your the lecture series, of which you're perhaps most famous, The Meaning Crisis. Right. And my, when I watched, I mean, I confess, I can't say I've listened to every single 50, episode, <laughs> 50 episodes. That's fine. But, <laughs> but enough to get a strong sense. It did feel to me like a kind of, uh, love letter to cognitive science. Very much, you know. very much. So, I mean, oh, the, 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 so this is the other thing. So I, I, I do the degree in cognitive science, and because I've done so much psychology, I'm asked as a graduate student to start teaching some of the introduction to cognitive science right. and some cognitive psychology courses because I actually have the education for it. Right. So I'm starting to do that, right? And I, I, I And so... For a very long time, Jonathan, I'm the only person at the University of Toronto teaching cognitive science. Okay, well. So that that was and there's a there's a dark side to that. That was you know it's isolated at times. I very I didn't feel like I had colleagues, right? Um, and but on the other on the other side, what it's given me um, things have turned around totally. I, let, let's, let me take a moment for the University of Toronto. Now is like wholeheartedly behind cognitive science. They're very supportive of me, very supportive of work, deeply appreciative. I'm now the director of the program, so I just want to make clear where the standing is now. But at that time, it was like, right? But what that meant was, because I was the only one, I got to articulate and develop a vision for the cognitive science program. Right. Why this matters. Yeah, why this matters. And so I, I did it... Um, not just by desire, but by design, because I, I sort of, I was in the position, right, of... Yeah, defining this field. Oh, exactly, yeah. right, exactly. Right. And so I, I developed a particular model, which I argue for, for cognitive science, which is called synoptic integration, yeah. right? And, and I had in this particular vision. And two things. Yes, I think th that, I think that model, the synoptic integration model of cognitive science, is the closest analog we have to ancient philosophy. Right. What was going and also, for me, it, it, it addresses a very important criticism I have of a lot of current science, especially psychology, the science I practice, right. 
specifically, which is the fact that innovation is being prioritized over integration. Okay. And that is, I would argue, that's driving the replication crisis right. in a lot of these sciences. Okay. okay, I want to hear more about that. But first, just, just the first thing people will be asking is by synoptic integration, you basically mean there are many converging fields that, that comprise cognitive science. Yeah. And, yeah. and your, your way you taught it was to work on how they integrate and how they Exactly, integrate. exactly. So it's not, you, it's not just dabbling here and dabbling there, or just I do one of the cognitive sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it means is, uh, I, I sometimes use the analogy of like each one of the, 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 the way we talk about the mind is like each country with, uh, like with, with its own language right. and it's, so, so the neuroscientist talks about the brain and, and does M MRIs, and then artificial intelligence, they, they, right, they talk about learning algorithms. And so each one, and, and the problem is we have all of, and it means it's... There's no lingua franca, really. Exactly, right, 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 right. exactly, exactly. And so this is where the training in academic philosophy was helpful because it had given me, oh, but how do you move between different discourses right, right. in a way in which you can get them to be like reciprocally and, insightful. And epistemically coherent somehow. Yes, the, um, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. And the thing that th that does is it's it's like the Beatles, right? And that w when you get them working together, you get something emergent beyond what each one is capable of. And that's what you feel in the Meaning Crisis series, by the way. This Because, I mean, the I, I don't think the term cognitive science does justice to what cognitive science represents. Because yeah. the two words are both, in their own way, some would find them attractive, but they have limitations, right? Oh, cognitive, oh. I, I, well, I, when I hear no, no, it, no, when I hear it, it's not enchanted. You know, when right. I hear cognitive science, yeah, I hear yeah. something about the mechanism of mind, let's say. Ah. And when I hear science, I think method, discipline, you know, rigor, um, but I also think sort of men in white suits. Whereas in your Meaning cr Crisis series, you're really speaking about the evolution of civilization yeah. through the sort of relationship between mind and reality. Yes, yes. And that's not captured by the, the label, cognitive yeah. science. Yes. I yeah. guess that's what I meant. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, sorry, I just want to sort of reflect on that. that that's very good. You're right. I, I ne Which is why it was a sort of genius to call it the meaning crisis and not cognitive science. Yes. <laughs> you know, because, yes. it, because it, 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 it is about the meaning crisis when it's properly understood. Yes, yes. And, 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 I, and I do think that it's the meaning crisis has to be addressed by something that's pursuing synoptic integration. Right, I agree. Yeah. So, so I want to come to meaning crisis in a moment, but first, sure. because you're a cognitive scientist, and this is the thing, being a scientist seems to matter a lot to you. I've heard a lot yeah. of your podcasts where you're speaking with, um, though, and the terrain will venture into metaphysics or theories of consciousness, um, sometimes even the sacred. And you come remarkably close on all of these occasions to something like a supernatural claim, but you always slightly pull back and say, yes. ultimately, I'm a scientist yeah. and particularly a naturalist. Yes. Can you tell me more why that matters to you so much? Well, I mean, there's two reasons. One that's idiosyncratic, which has to do with that background. Right. That I, yep, it, totally. And I, and, and, you know, and, I, and I don't put that on center stage because that's not a reason to persuade anybody else. Sure. Uh, but, but it drives you. It drives me. It drives me, which is like no. Uh, I, 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 there's, uh, there's few, there's few things that I won't sort of engage. Uh, but fundamentalism of various kinds right. is, is something that no, it's, sorry, it's a threat. Yeah, yeah. It's just I won't, I won't. And so there's definitely that. And people have said, I bet you there's something dark in John's background why he won't sort of turn to Jesus or something like that. I mean, no disrespect to Christianity, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and it's like. That's fair. That's fair. But I hope that that is not what I'm putting into like the arguments and the theoretical explanations. So the but that that psychological it's there. It's a motive. It's ongoing. Um, but on the other hand, for me, um, and 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 I guess this is this is again my I, I have a feeling of loyalty. <laughs> it's like right to. Um, what I saw in Plato and in Socrates and and the whole Neoplatonic tradition. Yeah, I mean, if, and, yeah, and you, the, the you late mentioned Siddhartha as well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So I have a loyalty to all of these people, I, I, and you know, the Neoplatonic tradition is the closest label I would sort of put on myself. Right. Um, now, why does that connect? It? Because at the, at the forefront, and I'm being I've been deeply influenced by Pearl uh, and, and other people on on this DC Schindler. Who is a Christian, by the way? But the idea that at the forefront of is, the, is this uh, this idea that 
that the, the, the machinery of intelligibility and the, the, the processes of being are like you can't separate them. That, that intelligibility is the thing that gives us access to being. Right, right. So you, that's, I mean, that was almost ontology, epistemology, but you're using other language for it, or, or is it more than that? Um, it's, it's more than that because I, I, I think of intelligibility uh, as not just uh, well, this has, we can talk about this later about the four kinds of knowing. I, I, and this goes to the. Well, right. Let's go. We can even go there now because yeah. because um, you know, because you're a cognitive scientist. What's interesting is um, when you mobilize your arguments, you have to rely on nomenclature and concepts yeah, and yeah, yeah. and evidence bases. And those who know your work well will know you quite often come to four e cognition yes. and sort of four p epistemology, yeah. broadly speaking. Um, maybe take a moment now just to explain those things because I want from there to get into what we mean by transjective oh. and then maybe come back to the, what you just said about the intertwining of something more than ontology and epistemology, something more than objective subjective oh, right. and, and see how those two worlds... That's, that's a great way to go. Them. Let's do that. That's so, excellent. So, but Thank first, you, for the, those watching, what do we mean by these terms? So 4E, and I, think, I, I actually think it should be 6E, but 4E has become very uh, the way of, of, of uh, teaching. So I had, again, the great good fortune that one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto and somebody like who um, I, I would consider even a friend was Evan Thompson. Yeah. And Evan Thompson is one of the... Evan Thompson is... is in active cognition and, and he well he, he yeah he he is one of i think the him and varela are, to my mind are the founding figures uh for e cognitive science there's a lot of other important people like gallagher is important and of course there's prefigures in funda people like marlo ponti but the basic idea is well it, spelling out the e's the first is the idea that cognition is inherently embodied so instead of thinking of the body as just sort of Cartesian clay that is a vehicle that is molded and moved by the mind, right? What you do is you actually realize that the biology of the body is actually constitutive of cognition. And so my particular work, Relevance Realization, says, right, this very important function of being able to zero in on relevant information relies on me being a biological being, right? right? And so that's like... If I, if I don't have the bioeconomy of my body, I would be like a computer. And when a computer faces information, it doesn't care about one piece of information over Which another. AI struggles with a bit. Right? Exactly. Well, yeah. struggles yeah. with a yeah. lot. Yeah. Right. That's, that's the relevance problem. Right. And so this is the idea that cognition is inherently embodied. And then the, and going with that is the idea that it's inherently embedded. This is the idea that cognition isn't in my head. It's like it's right. So, again, it's like biology. Is an organism adaptive? Well, the adaptivity isn't in the organism. It's between the organism and the environment. The same thing with cognition. Um, it's inactive. This is Evan's uh, main idea, that what we're looking at aren't so much you know, propositional processing in a computer. What you're looking at is a dynamical system that is constantly modifying this sensory motor loop. So the mind is much more enacted than, than what we like sort of argued in your head. Right. And then the last one is extended, right. which is the idea that like, what we're doing right now, yeah. you and I together are making this conversation together, and the conversation has a, t starts to take on a life of its own, and it's solving problems that you and I can't solve individually. So cognition is extended through other people and through the environment. That would also apply to your phone or your calculator or your pencil as well. Yes, right? yeah. yes. When, right. extended. So the four E's then. So yeah. in, in cognition is embodied and embedded enacted and extended. Uh, extended, yeah. And I think there should be two more. I'm curious, tell me more, yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that's become really central is that we should think of cognition as emotional because what we've done is tended to separate cognition and emotion into these... Uh, yes, uh, separate right, right, yeah, so, yeah, sure. That's action. what I meant by cognitive science, by the way, as well. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so this is to, no, to see that emotion, right, affect broadly, it, yeah, 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 right, yeah. is broad, is deeply... Again, back to relevance realization. I have to care about this information and not care about that right. information. And then, uh, exactly. Yeah, when it comes to political psychology, the emotional aspect of cognition is particularly important. I oh, guess. well, yeah. and it, for all of it, I think also for the sapiential, and, uh, right, having to do with wisdom, because, I mean, Socrates was much more, well, but what do you care about? Right. What do you care? Not so much just your arguments, but because often the arguments don't come to any conclusion in the dialogues. What, what's at stake here? Yeah, what do you care? And he's trying to reorient people to what they care about. The last one is um, 
exapted. Um, this comes from the work of Michael Anderson and the idea that cognition is uh, like you, you, air, they, computer metaphors are used. Like you have circuits that um, either evolved or are or, or learned for doing one function yeah. Yeah. and then you co-opt them and repurpose right. them for doing other things. Right. So I, I, I played chess professionally for many years and I otherwise don't use it. Like I don't think of a chessboard when I'm living. I have no doubt that I've exacted something or other. I, I, yeah. I think there's some, some preliminary evidence to support that. Yeah. So that's sort of the, the standard 4E. And then, like I say, most people in practice are, yeah. are, are 5E or 6E. Okay, okay, great. And then the four Ps, just to sort sure. of get yeah. the full, full nomenclature yeah. in play. Uh, so that's me trying to do a synoptic integration of all of the 4E cognitive science and trying to get it into a form that I think would help make, make sense to people of, the, of cognition, and also in a form that's helpful to get them to see what's at, what we're talking about when I'm talking about the meaning that's at stake in the meaning crisis, because it's not sort of just semantic meaning. Okay. Okay. So, but I mean, um, okay. So the, I see. So it's, it's the four P's I think of as like how we know anything really. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's a how we know it in some way. So it's different forms of how. Yes. It's not based on the content. Yeah. Yeah. So there's different ways you can do taxonomies and people often want a, a monkey with the taxonomy. I said, no, no, like you can make a taxonomy however you want. Like if you make, the taxonomy on the basis of content, you're going to have like you're going to have like right. you know knowledge about Australia, knowledge about the solar system, sure, sure, and sure. right, right. No, th you're right. This is much more about the manner and the mechanisms of knowing than it is about the content. Right. Yeah. But I mean, so at the moment to, to bring it to the present, you know, the news cycle is about Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, there are propositional things there about what's the capital of Russia, what's the capital of Ukraine, where's the border. Then you have sort of procedural, um, yeah. how, how, how do you discuss this matter or, or yes. how do we make decisions about this? What are the things in play? And then you have um, question of perspective. Like how does it look in Moscow? How does it look yeah, in yeah, Kiev? Yeah. How does it look at the UN? Yeah. And then you have something about participation. What's it like to be at the border in the east of Ukraine, for yeah, example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What um, identities are you assigning? What identities right. are, you, are, are you assuming? Right. What roles? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I mean, it's not, not to needlessly politicize. I just mean to bring it to, to bear that no, no, in any given context, there are always these multiple ways of knowing that yes. are baked in. Yeah. And and so, I mean, this is part of the, the talk I'm giving tomorrow, but uh, and, and to see the, 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 the dependency relationship between yeah. them. So, like, you, you have your propositions, but you have to, which, how do you select and choose and coordinate your propositions? Well, that's the, the procedural, that's right, the, right. No, that's yeah, the, right, it, yeah. right, right. But then, okay, but which skills should I activate? Well, that's going to be based on my, your, my, your situational awareness, your, your perspective. Well, which states of mind should I engage? That's going to be based on, on your you're identity. Yeah, yes. It, yeah. And so you have the dependency, right? And that's what I meant earlier about when I'm talking about intelligibility, I'm not talking about just, intellectual in the modern sense. Too bad we lost the ancient sense of what right. intellectus meant, yeah. right? Which, what, which was, just in case we don't know. Oh, oh. So the, 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 the older idea of intellect, well, intellection was the process of, uh, of, of basically conforming, coming into unity with something uh, when, when you're knowing it. So it's much close. It, it would be much closer to almost what we use like with the word insight, right? right. right? Where you, oh, I, I suddenly see into yeah. the situation. Yeah. Right. So, 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 John, the reason I wanted to bring in those tools yeah. is just that um, they're part of the, the sort of context or the atmosphere for the next part of the question, which is, you know, a, every so often you're writing or you're speaking, I come upon this word transjective. Oh, yes. And it's interesting because so much of the world deals with the language of whether something's objective or subjective. Yeah. And what I really want to ask you in a minute is where the subjective comes from. Yeah. Uh, but first, I want you to speak about why you find this word transjective useful, what it gives us, because it seems to be part of your, I've noticed you're using it quite a lot. Right, so this is an attempt to bring together sort of a strain from Heidegger, a strain from 4E Cognitive Science, and a Platonic strain. So let's go back, Charles Taylor, and i got to mention him because he's the great Canadian yeah, philosopher, yeah, yeah. so yay Canada. Um, but, you know, this idea of, like the older, we have... We have a representational epistemology. We're over here, and we're trying to point at that thing over there, and 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 then we we get we've been lost in, but how can I ever know that I'm pointing beyond my, and all that sort of stuff, right? But the older epistemologies are contact epistemologies, so that you know something 
by conforming to it, right? And this is a, a participatory, perspectival, right? It's the way you probably think you know your beloved. You don't just know them by having propositions or skills. Your your identity is bound with theirs, and you also their perspective has become part of your perspective on yourself, right? So, right that. And so there's a, it, it's not inappropriate if you hear it carefully to say that's a knowing by loving. You enter into union yes, by really, yes. and philosophy is the love of wisdom, right? Okay, so there, 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 there's that in Plato. And then there's in, so the conformity is what matters then is the space in which the, right, the agent in the arena can, right. can actually come into contact. And that's not going to be a subjective thing, at least the way Descartes means it. Right. And it's not going to be part of the objective physics. It's going to be something that grounds the very possibility of them coming together. Right. Okay, and then from Heidegger, the notion of truth not as either coherence of propositions or correspondence between the propositions of the world, but again, that which makes any coherence or correspondence possible. So it lies beneath them, right? And then for e-cognitive science, especially from the work of Gibson, is at the core of enacted cognition is the notice of an affordances, right? And an afford, like the, gra the grass, or like the, 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 walk, the floor is walkable. Right, and that's not a property of the floor. It's not a property of me. It's a property of the real relation. Yeah. And so, what I'm trying to do with the word transjective is get that conformity, right. that notion, that the aletheic notion of truth, that Heidegger notion right. underneath, right. and the affordance notion from Gibson, and bring them all together and say, let's bring them all together, make them super salient, and say that is actually really important in a way that is typically fall, falling out of, like it's not, it's being ignored. Right by the cultural cognitive right. grammar that we have about subject and object. Right. So that's what, I, that's what I thought, and it's beautifully articulated. Am I right in thinking that there's a relationship between the transjective and participatory knowing? You say oh, they're, for, they're yeah, quite closely related. Yeah, very much. Right. I, I, so I, I think of transjectivity as the ontological, I don't know what to call it, because uh, any language I use, people are going to put it in one of these two boxes. Right, right. But something like the ontological basis for participatory knowing. Okay. Okay, so which, which is, so that's, that's good, because that's what I suspect, and I want to just hold, park or bracket that thought, and come back to what you were saying earlier about um, something to do with the, the mechanism of mind and the sort of, sort of ontology of being, the nature yeah. of reality, um, and they're sort of being inextricably linked. Yes. They're sort of one actually, they're mutually co-informing and co-creating at some level. I want to sort of hold that thought too when we come back to the naturalism, right? So yeah. what, and I'm, because I'm, I'm trying to understand for no, you, yeah, I'm trying to understand for you, I, I totally understand vis-a-vis -vis the biography and the history, the commitment to naturalism being resolute. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious in that context, given everything you've said about the experience of consciousness, the participation in life, where you feel that comes from? Like, does it have an origin for you? Do you see it as an emergent property? And if so, what kind and how? Because I feel as though these tools might help us sort of make sense of yeah it. i mean so if you, uh, i i can i I'll, i think i can do a thing where i bring back sort of the psychological and the epistemological right. which uh, i mean um a friend of mine once said people go into psychology to study what they lack right, uh, right? um and so i study relevance um so i think <laughs> oh, that's, <right>. that's <laughs> no longer true but yeah, yeah. but uh but but it was for me growing up i was very much um all, like um, I didn't belong in my family in, in, in a lot of ways. Now, now I, I, I'm, I have one sister who's very dear to me, and like she's, um, I really appreciate the way she has always reached out. So I don't, I don't want to take it too blink, but, but, um, but that that sense of relevance and connect that, that right, being connected and relevant right. has been very important to me psychologically. But relevance right. is the prototypical transjective thing. Right. Right. And so and since I think relevance is relevance realization is the core of cognition and the core of intelligibility, right. there's a deep connection between intelligibility and transjectivity. Relevance is the prototypical transjective thing. And the transjective is the sort of ontological basis for participatory knowing. Yes. Which is another way of saying what it's like knowing what it's like to be alive. I mean, maybe not alive, because it's always quite specific, it's, it's situational. It, it, it's knowing what it's like to be an agent in an arena. arena so right. That, that fit, right. And they, so I love that expression, by yeah. the way. I had a moment, a podcast moment, we've all had these moments, of walking down the street and hearing that agent in the arena 
And it was a kind of musicality to that. I thought, oh, wow, beautiful. I really love that expression. Um, and I'm, I, that's because you are an agent in the arena, as I am, and we all are. Yeah. Um, and I guess... I want to just be clear that that was something that Christopher Master so, okay. and I worked out together. Of course, yes. of course, and, and, and rightly so. Um, but I love the expression, and I'm just wondering, for you as the agent in the arena, to come on now to, to how you made, through your agency, yeah. this lecture series for which you're famous, The Meaning Crisis. Um, because how much of that was perceived by yourself? How much of that was perceived through you know, your own experience of being alive? Did you feel the meaning crisis yourself? Because when I first heard meaning crisis, I thought, if anything, I've got too much meaning. I feel like saturated, you know, inundated with it. Right. Um, but I know that having watched now some of the lectures, it's, um, well, there's so many layers to it and it's so subtle. Maybe you can tell us the what, what gave rise to that, you know, through your agency, creating this arena, the meaning crisis? Yeah. How, what, how did that come about? So Awakening from the Meaning Crisis came, away, came about again because of Evan Thompson. Right. Um, so I, I had, after I did my, the, the BSc in cognitive science, I went back into philosophy, but I did my PhD thesis on cognitive science. Right. So I did, right? Um, and so I was, and I was also teaching. And then Evan was asked to teach a course called Buddhism and Cognitive Science, and he couldn't teach it. And he said, "But John could teach that course." Oh, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So I owe I owe a lot in many ways to Evan. Um, um, and so um, I I started teaching that course, and and you know, and cognitive science was turning towards the four E's, and I've been doing this, all this Tai Chi and mindfulness. I'm, I think I was the first person at U of T to teach mindfulness as an academic topic, okay, as a scientific. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm, I'm experiencing this personal kairos of the science and the spirituality are suddenly right. coming right. together. And I start to teach this in this course, Buddhism and Cognitive Science. And I start to see, I'm starting to see how this convergence can address this yes. hunger, yes. right? And I, and I start to teach this part and my, the, my students' eyes are like yeah, yeah, yeah. about this material. Yeah, yeah. And I start to realize, oh, wow. This, you're, feeding, you're meeting a need. You're, yeah, you're, there's a deep need right. here. And so, right, and I've already read a lot of Heidegger, so I'm knowing about, right, the, the, this deeper idea about, you know, the crisis, right? And, and I start to realize, oh, this is how this is coming into people's right. lives. And, 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 and what, they're ta- what they're trying to talk about is they're trying to talk about two things. They're trying to talk about meaning as connectedness, right. Right. and they're trying to talk about wisdom as transformation. Right. But our culture just doesn't have... They, they don't have, yeah. They don't have the tools. You mentioned wisdom famine somewhere. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, um, so, so, yeah, all of this is sort of necessary material to, to get to what, I, what in some ways is the heart of the matter for me. So you've, you've spoken about dialogos. Yes. As a, and as a, as a diabetic, I know that dia doesn't mean to. It means yeah. sort of more like through. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think it's com- commonly misunderstood. People hear dialogos and they assume, or dialogue, and they assume it's about two people. But you're yeah. really talking about something going through you. Yes. And so the word dialogos, you'll explain it better than me, but it's the logos coming through the conversation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, it, it, so the, the sort of the, the patron saint of this is Heraclitus. Right about don't listen to me, my words, but listen to the dialogue, right. d- listen to the logos, right. Right? right? And all things are one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's all there. All things are one is a deeply sort of participatory, conf- right. right, right, right? And, and there's about the connectedness. And then he's talking about the speech is actually like it's something, and there's a through line going through the speech, and that's the logos. Right. Something is gathering in the words right. all. All of this stuff we've been talking about, all this ability, all this intelligibility, sure. and it's taking on a life of its own. Right. And we can either we can either drop away from that and just try to capture it in information, or we can respond to it by saying, no, no, I'm going to transform to conform to this, right. and I'm going to try and follow it and afford it and, and unfold it more and more between me and the other. And so I'm doing this, and then I meet Guy Sandstock and Peter Lindbergh and all the stuff about circling. Right. Right, and I and, and as a cognitive scientist, I'm per- doing this participant observation, and what I'm seeing is people are getting into a flow state. right a flow state, but it's not just individual cognition, extended cognition. Right. It's distributed through the group. Right. There is a collective intelligence that is being activated, and what so happens? It's embodied and acted. It's, yeah. the, it's the works. It's all, it's yeah. all of them. Yeah. It's the works. And what's happening is I'm also seeing people from all different backgrounds, mostly secular. And what the, first of all, they discover this profound kind of non-sexual, right. non-familial right. intimacy. Right. But yeah, but it's an eros. Yeah, 
right? But it's not no, no, that not yeah. that eros, yeah. Yeah, but so they get that, and then what happens? And I, we just did a workshop, uh, guy and Chris and I. Uh, all right, uh, what happens is once what can happen is they can go from this kind of intimacy to a triangulation. You and I also start to feel intimate with that logos, right? So, so this is great. So this is where I, I and I, and this is where the part of me listening to John because you know, this kind of moment in a conversation where I'm thinking, but what is he really talking about here? Right? There's a part of me that wants to feel: is this where? Many others would say God, ah. or many others would say, you know, when we've spoken about the transjective, um, we haven't got the kind of cosmological framework. Sure. Um, you said you're a scientist, you've trained as a scientist, you, um, that identity matters a lot to you. You've also said that you're, for various reasons, your sort of underlying philosophy or meta theory is naturalistic. Yes, extended naturalism. Extend, right, yeah. I, even so, but even extended naturalism, I'm curious to know where, for example, the experience of subjectivity, the experience of participation, the sort yeah. of sense of being alive, yeah. your sense of the sort of ultimate foundation of that, where is that coming from? Is it coming from matter? And if so, what is matter? Oh, so ontologically, yes, yes. Um, well, uh, uh, another way of framing the question, if it helps, is what's the ontology of subjectivity? Well, I don't know if I'd put it as the, I put it as the ontology of transjectivity, but maybe because that's very much, the logos is not in you or me, it's between right, us. Right, right, okay. which is transject. Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, so that's, an that's a very appropriate question to ask because the third movement people move is they go from this intimacy right. to, into, to triangulation right. on the logos, and then the logos as this, ex this experiential knowing, the participatory knowing right. of how intelligibility plugs into being, and then they start to relate right. to the ground of being. And, and it's suffused with meaning, I guess. And, oh, and, and, and that's what I was going to say. With all these secular people, they start using inherently religious terms to talk about this experience. Right. And of course, the Logos has a huge history within right, Western spirituality, yeah. right? Yeah. So where, how do I ground that? So for me... Um, this is part of what I mean by extended naturalism. So maybe if you'll let me talk yeah, about that course, for a second. Yeah. yeah. So for me, the problem with current... Uh, so for, first of all, for those who are more sort of philosophically oriented, I think the arguments against reductive physicalism are powerful, powerful. Very, very powerful. Um, and so what most people have is they have a layered epistemology... Sorry, they have a layered ontology now, right? right? And which is odd because the, the the leveling of being with Scotus and the nominalism of Occam was what really did away with the the neoplatonic sort of structure but we have a layered on we have a layered ontology too but we just put the most real at the bottom right, right with with the quantum or whatever right. and everything emerges up right. the problem with that is that can't be an adequate emergence up sure. Okay, so two things. First of all, that's that has exactly the same structure as emanation down. Right. It's, it's, this is an old argument by Katz, right? The metaphysics is meaning. The, the, any argument you give for this, you can. I can easily, if you, if I've done first year philosophy, I can turn it around and say I can give you a, an emanation metaphysics just as readily. Right. Right. And so I think there is, and I mean this deeply. There's an undecidability. So when you try to do either one reduction, you know, reduction up with emanation or reduction down. Right. I think you're, and you're talking basically matter to mind, mind to matter, or not quite. Well, I'm talking more. I'm talking. I'm talking matter up to various levels of complexification, yeah. right? Cognition, mind, conscious. But I'm also talking about the fact that there is also emanation down. The, so this is part of for e cognitive science. It's the idea. If I can use an analogy, of course. okay. So I have I have all of the interactions of the chemical processes, right? And that and that bottom up produces the structure of the tree right. but the structure of the tree actually uh, alters the probability of the micro events right. so the tree does this so the probability of a photon hitting a chlorophyll right. molecule right. so there's a top down constraint and on, there's on bo the bottom up process right. bottom up. and so i think where that grounds out and you can see that all the way through your cognition even when you're reading you're reading simultaneously from the letters up to the words and from the words yeah. down to the letters yeah. i think that structure of intelligibility, that structure of biology are pointing to the fact that our ontology, you, it's not emanation or emergence, it's emanation emergence. Like the, they're completely interpenetrating. And right. they're completely right. interpenetrating and interaffording. And, and what's really interesting, it's the late 
late Neoplatonic Christian tradition, like when you when you read Eregina, or or, or I, I now think also Nicholas of Cusa, you see that's where they got to. That's okay. where they got to. Okay. And that's where you are, more or less. That's what I think. I mean, uh, uh, I, I do think for me, uh, uh, and I do, I, I, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to be presumptive, but I think one of the problems with how we're trying to do physics right now is we are committed uncritically to a purely, it must be a bottom-up answer. Right. When the, thing, the, the thing that's problematic is, of course, quantum is bottom-up, but relativity is top-down, right? It's cosmological, right? And, and your, so your morphology of that is that it, ultimately they're, they're sort of coextensive and mutually reinforcing somehow. Right, and so as long as we are trying to re re like reduce the one to the other, right, I th we're losing sort of something fundamental to yes. our ontology. Which is transjective even. Right? I think so, yeah. yes, yeah. I think so, yes. So it's heady stuff for, for those watching, but 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 heady. Uh, this is why I don't I don't I don't lead yeah, with yeah. that. <laughs> but I but I yeah. I want to get there in a sense because people who want to know you and know where you're coming from, I mean it's it's it sort of is a bit simplistic to say. So why doesn't he believe in God? But that is the question I want to ask. I, I I'm I'm happy to talk about this question. I'm really happy to talk about this question. But that's that I just that's my intuitive radio host question. You know, like <laughs> why doesn't this guy believe in God? He sounds like he does. Um. So. Part of it is um, I'm a post-nominalist, neoplatonic, right, non-theist. Congratulations. Right, right, right. right. Um, so what I mean by that, I, 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 sorry, I, I, I threw in that little bit of maybe useless caveat because, mm -hmm. because I don't want to say the thing you say at the party, which is, well, it depends on what you mean by God, right? And you say that and then it just devolves. Sure, sure, sure. But sure. I, or beliefs even, but yeah. Well, okay, so, but so for me, right, and I've I've learned because I've been corrected by other people like Jonathan Pajot and Paul Vanderclay and 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 this is why I'm in constant uh, dialogue with them. Yeah, ge yeah genuine dialogos with you know with 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 Christians that come to me in, in good faith, right? But I'll, I'll, same thing with Muslims, same sure, thing, sure, sure, sure. right? Right. And so the correction was I was calling it sort of classical theism, but classical theism is is actually very similar to what I would call non-theism, okay. and the the target I have. Which is the supernaturalistic version of theism? With it, I would now call that common theism, the theism, and and so when you get the the the, the two people, the the two groups that depend on each other, the atheist and the fundamentalist, to have something to talk about, right? Uh, because when typically when you, like when I saw uh, Jonathan go on the rationality rules and somebody who's not a common theist talk, there was like you tell the the the, the atheist. I think his name is Stephen. I'm not trying to diss the person or anything like that. It like he he, he like. Like they were on the same page. They weren't on the same they page. They, right. they, that was the point right. because right. you know, you know, uh, Jonathan was trying to say, but God isn't a thing, right? right? God is a non-thing, a nothing, and what a nothing? No, God, right? Whereas I take it, uh, and this is the Heideggerian influence on me, right? Um, that what's become common theism of today, and it's strongly associated with supernaturalism, is that God is a kind of being, a supreme being, and therefore, right. That's something like somehow analogous to our consciousness and will. Well, such a Tananda kind of view. Yes. Of, that, that would be classical, right? As I, as I understand the terms. That such a Tananda being consciousness bliss as the nature of God. That's much more like classical. Oh, yeah, that's what it, yeah. That's what so it, classical, classical Christian theology is deeply, deeply impregnated by Neoplatonism. Right. And at the high... The, the, so you're quite close to that, you would say. I'm very close. But that's to that. not the God of the Cross. That's sort of something. Elastic. Well, this is the yeah. thing that I'm really exploring yeah. right now, and, and, and I'm asking people to be kind to, to me when I'm saying this because I'm re I'm exploring Christian Neoplatonism because I'm trying to. There's there are, there are people who I deeply respect who were said no no the non-theistic one of Plotinus and the supernaturalistic God of the Bible. Are the same, and it's. And you're like, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, right. It's like, and and, and, and what I what I hear is all what I often hear. Oh, Jonathan and Paul, if, I, I really hope you're. I'm not like I I I have a tremendous amount of affection and respect. So I I, right. Um, this is why I'm I'm asking for kindness because, but right. I hear them ultimately when I when I push. I think Paul talks about God one and God two. It's not quite what I'm mapping, but it's similar, right? When I push on, but the, the supernaturalistic thing doesn't work. 
they they'll 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 go, go back to the other one. The Neoplatonic, but look, it, it right. God is not a thing. God's the ground of intelligibility. Uh, Paul uh, 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 Aunt Lettner is like that too, right? And it's like okay, but but yeah, but it, and it's like I can't. Right, I can't put them together. And when I read, like when I read Aquinas or when I read Maximus, I see them all constantly. They they start here, but they end up here. Right. Right. And so I, I don't. I, 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 I'm stumbling. You can hear me stumbling. Right, right, right. You, you put no, the, you're right. I mean, this is the sweet. This is the the cutting edge of where you are at the moment. I guess that's right. Yeah. That's exactly it. And so it's like, for me, I tend to say I think that. There's a lot of things about common theism that actually disconnect us profoundly from the sacred, right. whereas I think non-theism allows us to to talk, how, allows us to live and access and activate everything you and I have been talking about. Okay, wow. So if I see if I see if I'm following you, so there's something about the sort of Neoplatonic view um, that is quite similar to what would be called classical theism. Which yeah, very is much a view of reality as sort of being consciousness bliss, a yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. that's what I was getting at with the question yeah. of where subjectivity comes from, that that's sort of... David Bentley Hart is a Right, David Bentley Hart, right, so yeah. his classic, yeah. I've read that book on yeah. God that's particularly good on this. Um, and you're saying like that, you can sort of, you're almost okay with, because it's like nothing threatening there for you. I am, in the sense that I don't, I mean, I, I've, I've said on, this is what you can put on my tombstone, no nostalgia, no utopia, yeah. right? right? Yeah. Like, we can't go back, right. in my mind, right. because... Yeah. We can't forget nominalism. We can't forget this. We, we can't forget scientific right. or the scientific revolution. We can't forget the postmodern critique. We can't right. forget those. Sure. So we can't go back. Right. But you can see people like like D.C. Schindler in um, Love and the Postmodern Predicament trying to how can I transform that right. so that it can give good responses to the nominalism, to the scientific revolution, to the uh, postmodern critique. So I talk. That's what I. That I try to put that all together yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in in a post nominalist right. Neoplatonism. So no nostalgia and no utopia. That would. That, so that's where you get to what might be the, the other god, as it were, the, 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 what you call the common theism, yeah. which is something about belief in miracles, belief in yeah. supernatural events. Yeah. You're like, look, you have to persuade me of that. I, 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 I can't. And, and I've had a lifetime of people having, and a childhood of people having complete dominance and access to the guts of my psyche, trying to be persuaded. And I deeply believed at one point, and it just does. It didn't hold, and it does. That part doesn't now. Again, I mean, I, again, I want to be very, I want to be very respectful. I had a wonderful set of dialogues, genuine dialogos, with Paul Vanderclay and J.P. Marceau about miracles, yeah. right? And and so, and and we 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 did a lot. So my, de, my one of my 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 defining criteria, there are criteria, but my defining criterion for dialogos is both people get to a place they couldn't have gotten to on their own. It doesn't mean they come to agreement, but they both feel like, and that kept happening. But we didn't come to an agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we both, and this is why Paul and JP want to keep talking to right, me, right. right? And why I want to keep talking to them. Are they right. trying to convert you, or are they trying to learn from you? What do you think is going on? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've never got the sense that. I, I mean, I suppose they'd both be very happy. Jonathan would be too if I became sort of an explicit right. Christian. Uh, but I don't feel there's a secret agenda. I feel there's genuine listening, genuine love. Um, I want to talk to the two Pauls, Paul Vanderclay and Paul Antleitner, uh, uh, about the four L's. Right. Got, oh, right? four L's, which are, love, love's one of them, I'm guessing. I, well, so so I, I talk about it, I, I sort of put it like this, I, I want to talk about God before talking about God. I want yeah, to yeah. talk about God before we bring in all... Sure. The, the, the baggage. Yeah, right. all that's right. So I want to talk about love and life and light and logos. Right. Uh, and you, that's back to your Neoplatonic, yeah. Yeah. Sort of Neoplatonic yeah. classical theism. Yeah. All of those things belong there. They and do. you're like, and, and if you want to talk about God, I'll be there with you. Yeah. Right. Yes. But then they want to bring in God, heavy God, which is something asking more for some kind of historical uh, version of events and a certain kind of commitment that you maybe can't get. It's, it, it, I mean, it goes towards all the four P's of knowing, right? It, it, at propositional argumentative level, sort of common theism, I just, I, I can't, you can't... Yeah, I can't shine with it intellectually. Be, and, 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 and I can't make it jive with right. the scientific technological worldview. I have criticisms of the scientific right, right, technological right. worldview, yeah, yeah. but it's not, it's not optional for us, no, no, right? Sure, like sure. It, I, the Heideggerian thing that this is pervasive through our ontology, right? right? That, that, that is... That is very much the case. That's very much the case. 
But days. but I also can't get it like I can't. I can't participate in it. I can't. I, I, I can't. Right. Okay. So, I mean, for what it's worth, I might be on quite a similar page. And I, um, you know, sort of almost Christian for a long time now, but never yeah. quite, not quite getting there. Um, and it's not for, not because I don't want to be even. Like, I'm, I'm curious about you. Like, is there any sense in which you want to be trained in that way? or? So, it, it, I would, <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say one thing. I mean, I was just at a lunch. And talking about this with you know scientists working on psychedelics and so and, and other people and there's so many people that are like in that that N O N and yes nuns yeah, yeah, yeah. category and this this fact and that part of the awakening from the meaning crisis was to try and provide a, a place and a space and a vocabulary sure. for people that are in that to talk and think and reflect and grow, yeah, yeah. but uh, I was so. Uh, my son Jason, my older son, he lives with me right now because he's going to teachers' college. He's almost done. He's going to be a science high school science teacher. I'm very proud of him. Um, he uh, and, and, and like like me, he's a big fan of Spinoza because Spinoza is basically how you bring Neoplatonism into right. the Cartesian framework, right? That's why it's called the Ethics, right? Right. Um, and, and he's also, but he's been increasingly interested in Christianity, right? Because of Carlyle's book, Spinoza's Religion, best book on Spinoza I've ever read, right? And so he said this past Christmas, he wanted to watch the Franco Zeffirelli, Jesus of Nazareth. And so I'm watching it with him, right? And, and, and he's asking me about this, and he's sort of reading uh, the New Testament. Right? And, and it's interesting uh, about that. He's, he, he even now sort of wears a cross, right? Um, so he's moving in this way. And I'm hoping I'm being a good father, because I think he finds me extremely supportive in this, Right. But there's a, but but he but he's also like you and I on this too. Right. So he's right on that place, right, right on that spot. And part of me does think when I was watching watching the series, it was, wouldn't it be just easier and wonderful if I could just sort yeah. of almost like Surrender I'm holding, holding yeah. my breath and, yeah, right. and and I would love to just, right. I, you know, believe isn't the right word. That's part of my criticism of common theism. It tries to reduce everything to the proposition. Again, level. it's an like old school cognitive view, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so part of me is is like, uh, so I, belief isn't the right word, but w- belabin, to give your heart to, right? right? right. Uh, wouldn't, it be, could, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could just give my heart? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it would. It would. So I, that's, why, um, that's why I'm very careful when people label me as an atheist. I say, no, I'm not, mm-hmm. right? I, I'm a non-theist. I, 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 the, the sacred is important to me and getting into right relationship with the sacred. Is it what you're saying as well, that a non-theist and a classical theist are, are, are very hard to discern? Apart. I think so, and the thing, and the thing where, where they, uh, that, that's very interesting is Buddhism and Taoism are right. not non-theistic. So the, you don't think the Dalai Lama is an atheist as such, right? No, no, and you don't, right. you don't think yeah. of the, the Buddha as an atheist. That doesn't, no. that doesn't, doesn't track true, right, no, no. right. And what's interesting is again, uh, you know, Thomas Plant's book on you put take Arthur Vers Lewis's work and Thomas Plant. So Arthur Vers Lewis has made. Some of his books are these little thin books, and they're absolute gems. He basically makes the argument that Neoplatonism is the the cultural cognitive grammar of the spirituality of the West. Okay, wow. Yeah. And then Thomas Plant is basically making an argument. You, there's the Silk Road, right? That no one country controls the Silk Road. It's yeah. truly international, yeah. right? And there's not only trade of goods, there's trade of idea. So you have the physical Silk Road, but you have this intellectual... Yeah. Silk Road, and that, that Silk Road was Neoplatonism, because Neoplatonism it, it has entered into and can enter into reciprocal reconstruction with Christianity, Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, but also with elements of Vedanta. And right, so it's right. more verse, somehow it's like a, I don't know what the right analogy is, but it's somehow... I have an analogy, do you right. want to hear it? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the analogy I have is we, our culture is locked into the template of the courtroom of debate, but what Neoplatonism is, what it can be, is a courtyard of dialogos where the furniture of thought is properly disposed for allowing people to like do what i talked about they can each move it doesn't mean they come into agreement we're not seeking that but the capacity to generate genuine dialogos is afforded right and you what's lovely about this is you know you're not kidding in the sense that when you speak of sort of spiritual experience and deep meaning through dialogos or dialogos you know, it's, it's genuine. You know, it's not just a bunch of guys having a chat. No, right? no, you no, really no. are speaking about some kind of higher order emergent property that is of deep value. Yes, and the thing is that right that 
the practice of that. The, the Hado talks about askesis, right? right? The spiritual, the practice of that, it, it, right? It, 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 it puts you into a place where that, what we were talking about earlier, that sounds so uh, uh, heady and, and, you know, metaphysical about, you know, being and... Uh, that becomes realizable. That becomes participatory. Almost. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. So people, and this is for me. This is the, if you know, this is the, this is the how you awaken from the meaning crisis. You learn how to deeply fall in love with being again. Right, right, right. Great. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm, it's occurring to me that you know you mentioned no nostalgia, no utopia. Yeah. So an interesting note to end on. I suppose I'd want to ask. Maybe a little bit of nostalgia, maybe a little bit of utopia. <laughs> but, but what you're what you're leaning at is let's not place all of our hopes in either of those things. That somehow the sort of way forward in the meaning crisis and the broader meta crisis, it's a it's it's going to be messier. It's going to be a bit more about the synoptic integration. Yeah, so exactly, and it's also it's, it has to do deeply with relevance realization. Take the analogy that relevance realization is basically the cognitive in the way we've been talking about the cognitive analog for biological fittedness. Right. Not fitness. Fitness is just you survive long enough to reproduce. Fittedness is how do you fit to the environment long enough to reproduce, right? And, and, and notice that there is no essence to that, right? A creature can be big, small. Yeah, yeah. Like right? a sumo wrestler is fit in Japan, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, not, I mean yeah, in yeah, that yeah, yeah. sense, in that sense. Right. So, so right. And this is the, the evolutionary metaphor. Like, there is, there is no essence to relevance. There is no essence to cognitive connection and fitness to conformity. And there's also, just like you would, if, I, if you said to me, what's the final form of life? It's like, you don't understand life. Right, right. You, the, the, asking, if you're asking what the final form is, then you haven't... You haven't grasped what it is. Yeah. Right. That's why no utopia. Right, right. There is no end state. That's right. Okay. That's a great place to end. Thanks very much, Tom. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Tom. That was really wonderful. Pleasure.